Hello everyone. I hope you are doing well today. So today I want to say a few words about game theory. Uh, what is it, what it is, uh, in, in which context we use it in economics. Uh, what is a game? What is a strategy? What is a game? Uh, and what criteria we use to find uh, what the equilibrium or equilibria is or are going to be. And essentially, in the A-level curriculum, in the AP and I assume in the IB curriculum, there are only two types of equilibria that we are interested in, which are the Nash equilibrium and the dominant strategy equilibrium. So I'll show you these two concepts of equilibrium. And then if we have some time, I'll show you one application of game theory to uh, a game with two oligopolists, two duopolists. All right. I think we are ready to start. All right, so um, first it's important to understand what is the purpose of game theory. It's a method. It's a method that uh, is used not only by economists, by the way, but also by mathematicians. could be used by uh, people who study political, science, um, um, warfare, and many other, uh, biology as well. So it's not only used in economics. Uh, it's been uh, developed primarily by John Nash. And, uh, well, especially he was famous for, for, for this concept of Nash equilibrium. And he actually, John Nash, received the, uh, the Nobel Prize of economics. I, I forgot the year, but it's in the 90s, 1990s. I think it was 1996 or 1994 for his contributions to game theory. So what is the purpose of game theory? We study strategic interactions. So strategic interaction is simply a situation where um, the outcome for you you could say your payoff or the, 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 your benefit at the end of the game not only depends on your actions, it does not only depends on your strategies, but it also depends on the strategies, on the actions of the other players. That's the easiest possible definition of strategic interaction. Another word you can use is interdependency. When players, they depend on each other. Uh, yeah, that's the same meaning. Uh, between rational players, because of course, if we don't make the assumption that players make rational decisions, then it becomes very complicated to say anything about what the outcome is going to be. And these players, they interact in situations that we call games. Yeah, and I give the definition of what we call strategic interaction when they're individual payoffs. So a payoff is simply yes, a reward what you get at the end of the day after you've played the game. It could be a, a, a certain amount of profit, a certain amount of utility. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just what you get at the end of the, of, the, of the day. So it does not only depend on what you do, but also by what other people do. And if you want to define a game, you basically need three things. Uh, you need to define the set of players, who is involved in the games, who makes decisions in the game, a set of str strategies, which basically is what each player can do in, the, in this game. And the payoffs, which is simply the result of uh, every possible combination of strategy. So you take all the players and all the strategy and you can have, you will have a certain amount or number of possible combinations of strategies. And for each of these possible combinations, you need uh, to define uh, what reward, what payoff will go to each player. If you have that, you have a game under normal or strategic form. Uh, for now, I'm not going to talk about information, uh, which is usually something very important in game theory. There are games with perfect information or imperfect information. And there are also games with complete or incomplete 
information. Uh, but this is beyond the scope of the um, A-level, IB, and AP syllabus, so I'm not going to say too much uh, about it. All right, so uh, actually, I think the easiest way uh, to start is to help the students to understand how this works by using a payoff matrix. Uh, so by choosing a simple game with two players and, and two or three strategies. And I know that many teachers and textbooks, they start by the prisoner's dilemma. But I, I actually think it's a, a better idea is to uh, start by using games that everybody knows. And I usually start with rock, paper, scissors, because everybody knows how to play that game. So as I said, we need three things to define a game, a set of players, a set of strategies, and a set of payoffs. So let's see. So when we play rock, paper, scissors, there are only two players, player one, player two. Each player has the same set of strategy to play rock, paper, or scissors. Um, and so this is the set of players, the set of strategies, and now I have the set of payoffs. So let, let me help you to, to understand how this goes. So this is the utility, U stands for utility or profit, doesn't matter, of player I when uh, he play or he or she plays rock and the other player also plays rock. Uh, so in this case, it's, uh, it's a draw. Nobody wins, nobody loses, and everybody gets zero. The same thing happens when they both play paper and when they both play scissors. Uh, in this line, this is basically the line when I lose. For example, when I play rock and the other player plays paper, when I play paper and the other plays scissors, and when I play scissors and the other plays rock. In this case, I lose $10, for example. And the last line is all the situations where I win, all the combinations of strategies where I win, when I play scissors and the, uh, my opponent plays paper, and so on and so on. This is when I win. All right. So I can just write the game like this, but it's a bit technical. So usually what we use, we summarize this information in this payoff matrix. So you see on the diagonal, nobody wins. And uh, usually you, you have your yeah, player one on the uh, each row is for a strategy of player one. And each column is a strategy for player two. Uh, and so you have nine cells, which because you have nine possible combinations of strategy. And within each cell, you have these two figures. The first one is the payoff for player one. Uh, and the second figure is the payoff for player two. Okay, so for example, if player one plays paper and player two plays rock, then player one wins, gets 10, and player two loses, gets zero. All right, so this is a symmetric game. Well, I think it's, it's easy to, to understand this, this, this game that everybody knows. Another example that I use is what we call the battle of the sexes, uh, which is a, a very, um, <laughs> how can I put this? Uh, well, you'll, you'll see. It's, uh, you'll, you'll see what type of story this is. So in this game, there are two players. There is, uh, it's a couple. It's about the decisions made within a couple. So we have a man uh, and a woman. So M stands for M and W stands for woman. And have to decide where they are going to uh, go tonight and they, they have two options they can go to the opera so that's strategy O or they can go to the football game that's strategy F and as you can imagine because this is a very uh, uh, sexist story with a lot of cliches but why not uh, the man prefers to go to uh, the football game and uh, his wife prefers to go to see the, to watch the opera, okay. Uh, but they, they are free to do whatever they want. Each of them has to decide uh, where they are going to, to go tonight. And so I have the, the set of players, I have the set of strategies, uh, and now I have the set of payoffs. So that's the utility or the reward of the man when they both uh, go to watch the football game. Uh, which is the same as the profit or utility of the woman when they both go to the opera. So that's the option that they like best. You see, that's the utility or the payoff of the man uh, when they go to watch the football, which is what he likes best. And that's the reward of uh, his wife when they go uh, to see the opera, which is what his wife likes best. And that's, that's a big number, three. It doesn't matter what unit it is. 
uh, if uh, they are so they are together you see that in the first line they are together the second line they are also together but this is the utility of the person who uh, let's put it this way has sacrificed uh, himself or herself so for example if they go both go to the opera uh, the man has sacrificed himself just to be with his wife so he's still happy because he is with his wife but he has a lower satisfaction as the case in which they were both attending the football game. So it's only two instead of three. And this number here, it's the satisfaction of the wife when uh, her and her husband, they go to watch the football game. So she's happy because she is with her husband, but she would have preferred to be with him at the opera. So she only gets two rather than three. And the last line is what happens when they are not together. So for example, this one is when the man has chosen to go to the opera. Uh, but his uh, wife has decided to, to go watch a football game. And all this combination uh, reflects situations where they have made different decisions about where to go. And because they are not together, they cannot enjoy the show, the opera show, the football game. So they have a satisfaction of zero. Okay. So basically, that's the story of uh, two persons who have different preferences. But what matters the most is to be together. Okay, so same thing, we have this set of players, we have this set of strategies, we have this set of payoffs. I can summarize the information in this payoff matrix, okay? Now that we have these two uh, games, we can. Uh, it's time for us to introduce what we call the prisoner's uh, dilemma. I'm going to skip this because it's not very interesting. Uh, but same thing, you know how this works, right? So you have two players, which are two criminals, and this is not the first time that they have committed a crime, uh, but this is the first time that they get caught by the police. So we have two players, these two criminals, play one and player two. And they have two options. They are brought to separate uh, inter interrogation rooms, and they can either cooperate with the police or they can choose not to cooperate with the police. So uh, the C here does not mean uh, cooperate, it means to confess. To say, oh yeah, uh, I, I confess, uh, I, I'm the one who robbed the bank, or we both robbed the bank. Okay, so they cooperate uh, with the with the police. And the second option, L, means to lie. So they do not confess. They do not cooperate. They say, no, no, we have nothing to do uh, with this uh, bank robbery or with or with this crime or, or whatever. Okay. And now here's how uh, it works. If they both lie, so they do not confess the crime. Uh, they still go to jail because the police has enough evidence about some previous crimes that they have committed. So they still go to jail, but not for so long, only three years. So that's why I have minus three, which is they basically they lose three years of their lives. But they don't they have not cooperated with the police. So the police does not have enough evidence to uh, put them to jail for a longer period of time. If they both confess, they go to jail for a long time uh, because the police has enough evidence to put them to jail uh, for their previous crimes but also for their current or their latest crimes. But because they have uh, cooperated with the police, uh, they, they, they don't go to jail for as much as they could have because they have accepted to confess, to tell the truth. So in this case, they go to jail for 10 years. And what's interesting about that game is what happens when one uh, confesses and the other lies. So for example, if I confess, so I tell the truth, and the other lies, does not confess, does not cooperate with the police, I get a deal with the police. The police has basically told me, hey, if you cooperate, if you tell us the truth, before, you can put it this way, before your the other the other guy in the other in the other cell, uh, you get a deal with us, and you will not go to jail for a long time. But you have to co you, you have to be the first to cooperate. Uh, and in this case, I get the deal, so I go to jail because okay, I have confessed my crime. But I don't, I don't go to jail for a long period of time because I got the deal from the police. 
But my partner in this case, who has resisted, who has not cooperated with the police, uh, who has lied to the police, who has said, no, no, I have nothing to do with this bank robbery. In this case, if I have confessed, then my partner goes to jail for a very long time, simply because the, my partner has lied to the police and the police has enough evidence that my partner has committed that crime because I have confessed. So because my partner has lied and because police has enough evidence to put my partner to jail for a long time, my, my partner goes to jail for a very, very long time, 12 years. All right, uh, so same thing. This is how we can represent this game within a payoff matrix, okay? So, so far, you see that I'm not even trying to uh, solve the game to, to, to find out how we are going to, to, to find the equilibrium. For now, I'm just describing these three games. And now what I'm going to do is to show you how we can solve these games using two equilibrium criteria, Nash equilibrium and the dominant strategy equilibrium. Okay, let's start with the Nash equilibrium. So um, the concept of Nash equilibrium is based on the concept of best response. Uh, that's something very intuitive. A player's best response is the strategy which yields the largest payoffs, taking other players' strategy as given. So usually in high school, there are only two players. So if you want to find the best response of player one, you just uh, ask yourself if player one believes that player two is going to play strategy A, then player A should, or player one should choose strategy blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's very easy to do. I'll show you in a second. And an Nash equilibrium is simply a combination of strategy. We call that a strategy profile, which is a combination of strategies where everyone is playing a best response. <clears throat> so the consequence is that since everyone is playing a best response, nobody has an incentive to change uh, its, its strategy. And because nobody has an incentive to change anything, this is an equilibrium. That's it. So how do we do that? So for example, in this case, uh, is there uh, a Nash equilibrium? So what we should do is we uh, focus first on player one and we find the best response of player one. So for example, if I am player one and I believe that player two is going to play a rock, then my best response is paper, okay? Because 10 is better than zero and minus 10. This is the highest payoff. If I am player one, I believe player two is going to play paper my best response is to play scissors because 10 is better than 0 and minus 10 again. And finally, if I am player 1 and I believe player 2 is going to play scissors, my best response is to play rock. Okay, So I've, I have found the best responses for player 1 and I could do the same thing for player 2. All right, I'll do it uh, for, for this game. If I am player 2, I believe player 1 is going to play rock. My best response is to play paper because 10 is better than 0 and minus 10. Okay, you see how, we, how this works. Uh, so in this case, there are no Nash equilibrium because there is no cell. Actually, I should have circled uh, the best responses, but if you do that, if you circle the best responses, you will see, usually I do it with the students on the, on the smart board, uh, you will see that there is no cell where you have circled the two figures. And the consequence is that there is no combination of strategy where everyone or the two players, player one and player two, are playing a best response. The consequence is that there is no Nash equilibrium, so there will always be at least one player who will have an incentive to deviate from that uh, strategy profile. All right. Second game, let's try to find the best responses. So if I am the woman and I believe that uh, my husband is going to go to the opera, my best response is to go to the opera because uh, three is better than zero, so you could circle three. And if, uh, if I am a woman and I believe that my husband is going to go to the football game, my best response is to go to the football game because two is better than zero. You could circle two right here. So I have the best responses for uh, the woman. Let's try to find the best responses for the man. If I am the man, I believe my wife is going to go to the opera. My best response is to go to the opera because two is better than zero. And if I believe my, my wife is going to go to the football game, my best response is to go to the football game because three is better than zero. 
And in this case, you see that there are two same things. If you have circled uh, the best responses that I indicated, you see that there are two Nash equilibria. There are actually two cells for which you have circled the two figures. That's a quick and dirty way to find whether or not you have found the Nash equilibrium. Uh, so you have two Nash equilibria. So which one is, is it going to be? Uh, well, we don't know. Then it's a coordination problem. Uh, by the way, for those who are a bit more advanced uh, in game theory, I'm only looking for pure strategy equilibria. Of course, there would also be mixed strategy, uh, one mixed strategy equilibrium in that game. Okay, so you see in the previous game there were no Nash equilibria. Now we have two. Uh, what about in the yeah? So the strategy profile O and FF are both Nash equilibrium. Be careful with some with some things. Sometimes students they say that the Nash equilibrium is three two or two three. No, uh, a Nash equilibrium when you define it, you define it with the strategies that are played, not by the payoffs. Okay. In the prisoner's dilemma, let's see how this works. So let's try to find the best responses again. So if I am player one and I believe player two is going to lie then my best response is to confess because minus one is better than minus three. If I am player one and I believe that player two is going to confess, my best response is also to confess. Minus 10 is better than minus 12. And the same goes with player two. If player two believes that player one is going to lie, uh, the best response of player two is to confess. Minus one is better than minus three. And if player two believes that player one is going to confess, Player two should confess minus 10 is better than minus 12. In this game, you see that there is only one Nash equilibrium. Same thing, please circle the, uh, the best responses that I have mentioned. And in this case, you will see that only this cell, only in this cell, you have circled the two uh, figures, which indicates that this game has a unique Nash equilibrium. All right, so you could practice. You can practice with this exercise. I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, but in this case, you would find that we have one thing called Nash equilibrium. You could do it with your students uh, just to make sure that they have understood how this works and how to identify uh, Nash equilibrium. Uh, it may be the case that one game has zero Nash equilibrium. This was the case for rock, paper, scissors. It may be the case that there is only one Nash equilibrium. This was the case uh, with the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, or it is possible that a game has several Nash equilibrium, which was the case uh, with the uh, battle of the sexes. All right, so that's the first way we can find <coughs> uh, the equilibrium of a game. And usually it's, it's sufficient in, in high school. Uh, for, for, for the questions you have in AP, in, um, in IB, and in... Uh, a level, this criterion is sufficient. Uh, but something that is also commonly used uh, is the concept of strategic dominance, uh, which is a stronger criterion of uh, equilibrium. Uh, by that, I mean that um, a dominant strategy equilibrium is necessarily a Nash equilibrium, but the opposite is not true which means that a Nash equilibrium is not necessarily a strat, uh, stra, uh, strictly dominant strategy equilibrium, which means that in a game you, you, may, you may have more Nash equilibria that strictly dominated strategy, sorry, strictly dominant strategy equilibrium, but it's not possible that you have more strictly dominant strategy equilibria than you have Nash equilibrium. Okay. So what is a dominant strategy? What, let's start with what it means for one strategy to dominate another strategy. We would say that strategy A dominates strategy B for, player, for any player if strategy A yields a larger payoff than strategy B. And the important part here is regardless of the strategies of the other player. So it does not matter what the other players are going to do. It's always better for me to play strategy A. And of course, if you are rational, you will never play a dominated strategy. You should always play strategy A over strategy B if strategy B always provides a greater payoff. And a dominant strategy for a player is a strategy that dominates every other strategy. Okay, so if you have three strategies, A, B, C, 
and A dominates B and A dominates C, then we will say that strategy A is a dominant strategy. Okay. And what we call a dominant strategy equilibrium, it's a situation where every player has a dominant strategy. So every player has one strategy that dominates all other strategies. That is always better than all other strategies, regardless of what the other players play. So this is the strongest possible uh, equilibrium criterion, much stronger than the Nash equilibrium. And well, let's see uh, if our three games, rock, paper, scissors, uh, the battle of the sexes and uh, the prisoner's dilemma, let's see if any of them has a dominant strategy equilibrium. Okay, and this is what I say, a dominant strategy equilibrium is also a Nash equilibrium, but the opposite is not always true, simply because the DSC criterion is much stronger than the NE criterion. Okay, so do we have a dominant strategy for any player in uh, this game, rock, paper, scissors? Is there one strategy that is always better than all the other ones? What we should do is to compare strategies uh, two by two. Uh, let's, st let's start with player one. And let's compare rock and paper. Is rock better, better than uh, paper? Well, you see that it's better if the other player plays scissors, but it's worse if the other player plays rock. So you see that whether or not we should play rock or paper, it depends on what the other player is going to do. So rock does not dominate paper or paper does not dominate rock. Let's compare rock and scissors. Is there one between rock and scissors for player one that is always better than the other? Well, we see that rock is better than scissors if player two plays rock, but uh, rock is worse than scissors if player two plays paper. So same thing, we see that uh, whether rock is better than scissors for player one depends on what player two is going to do. So strategy rock does not dominate strategy scissors and vice versa. So for player one, there is no dominant strategy simply because there is no, there is uh, not one strategy that is always better than the others. And because this game is symmetric, this is also the case for player two. So the con conclusion is that there are no dominated strategies in that game. And, and, and we understand we understand it because we all know this game and when you play rock, paper, scissors, there is not one strategy that is always worse than another. Let's look at the battle of the sexes now. Is there one strategy that is always better than the other? Okay, so let's focus on the, on the woman uh, because same thing, this game is symmetric, so we only need to look at one player. Uh, is opera better than football? Is, is it always better than football? No. Opera is better than football if my husband goes to uh, the opera. But football is actually better than opera if my husband goes to uh, the football game. So you see that whether uh, opera is better than football depends on what my husband is going to do in this game. So the conclusion is that the strategy opera does not dominate the strategy football and the strategy football does not dominate the strategy opera. Okay, so there is same thing, no dominated strategies in that game. Now let's, let's have a look at the prisoner's dilemma. And same thing, let's try to find out whether there is one strategy that dominates the other. And if we find one, this would mean that we have a dominant strategy because there, uh, there are only two strategies. And again, this game is symmetric, so we only need to look at one player. So for player one, is lie always better or worse than confess? Let's focus on confess. We see that confessing is better than lying if player two lies. Minus one is better than minus three. And confessing is also better than lying if player two plays scissors, minus 10 is better than 12, minus 12. So you see that the strategy to confess is always better than the strategy to lie for player one. Minus one is better than minus three and minus 10 is better than minus 12. So the conclusion is that for player one, confessing dominates lying. 
And because we only have two strategies, it means that confessing is a dominant strategy. And since this game is symmetric, we can conclude that for player two, confessing is also a dominant strategy. So each player has a dominant strategy, which is to confess. Therefore, the strategy profile CC, confess, confess, is a dominant strategy equilibrium. And you see that it is also a Nash equilibrium. Okay. Here's an exercise, a uh, simple exercise, again, to practice, same, same thing, to make sure your students know how to find a dominant strategy equilibrium. You could also use this exercise to find the Nash equilibrium. I think you would only find one. I don't, I don't recall. Uh, you, would, you should find this combination of strategies as your dominant strategy equilibrium. All right. Good. Uh, before we finish this, uh, uh, let's see if I can share something else. Uh, I wanted to share another, another case. Mm, another exercise related to oligopoly, because it's often in oligopoly that we use this criteria of equilibrium. So just give me a second so I can find this document. I'm not very familiar with um, Facebook Live, so I'm, I want to make sure that I don't screw up. All right. Okay working. So if we look at this example, oligopoly and collusion, uh, I, at first I need to define the game. So I have two players, two businesses or firms, firm A and firm B. Each of them has uh, the same set of strategies to charge a high price or a low price. Charging a low price would be understood at competition and charging a high price would be understood at, as collusion. And the, um, the outcome is as follows. If they both charge a high price, uh, they can have, they have a 50-50% market share. So they have the same price and high price, which is above the average cost. And so they can have, they can make some profit. Uh, they would get uh, $4 million of profit. If they both charge a low price that is still slightly above their average cost, but they both charge a low price, so they still have a 50-50% market share, uh, but their profit margin is much lower, so they only get $2 million each. Uh, and if I charge a high price when my competitor charges a low price, then I get a 0% market share, so I make zero profit. Let's, let's assume that there is no fixed cost, otherwise my profit might actually be negative. And if I charge a high, oh, sorry, it should be the opposite. If I charge, let me correct that, it should be low high. Okay, that's better. And if I charge, if I charge a low price and my competitor charges a high price, I get the entire market share. I, I underprice my competitor. I charge a price slightly below the price of my competitor. So I get all the market for me. And even though it's a low price, because I have the entire market for me, I make a very large profit, $6 million. So same thing. This is how I define the game. I can uh, summarize it in this payoff matrix. Uh, and let's try to find uh, the equilibrium of that game. Uh, well, this would be the cooperative equilibrium, but let's not let's not uh, focus on that for now. So let's let's use the Nash equilibrium criterion for now. So let's try to find the best responses. So if I am firm A, I believe firm B is going to charge a high price, then my best response is to charge a low price. And if I am firm A, I believe firm B is going to charge a low price, my best response is also to charge a low price because two is better than zero. So you see that it doesn't matter what firm B is going to do. My best response is always to charge a low price, which indicates that the strategy low price is a dominant strategy for firm A. And because this game is symmetric, 
uh, we can also say that charging a low price is a dominant strategy for firm B. Okay, so each firm has a dominant strategy, which is to charge a low price. So the combination of strategy LL, low price, low price, is a dominant strategy equilibrium. And it also happens to be a Nash equilibrium. So this would be what we call the non-cooperative equilibrium, where they only make $2 million of profit each. Uh, what we call the cooperative equilibrium, this would be this situation where the joint profit is the highest, the joint profit is $8 million. This would be a situation where they can talk and commit to charge a high price before uh, the, the, the decision is actually made. And in this case, if this is possible, this equilibrium could be achieved. Uh, but if they cannot communicate and if they cannot commit to charge a high price before they actually make this decision, this cooperative equilibrium is not uh, achievable. The only situation where firms could achieve this equilibrium without uh, engaging in any form of communication and co commitment would be a, a case where the game is repeated an infinite number of times. Uh, in this case, and this is what the Falk theorem tells us, in this case, if businesses care sufficiently about the future, in, in other words, if the discount rate is not too high, in this case, it is possible that this cooperative equilibrium is achieved and forms a uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. But again, this is beyond the scope of the uh, syllabus. All right, I think that's all I wanted to tell for today, and this was already pretty long. Um, yeah, and I, I like game theory very much. It's one of my favorite fields of, uh, of economics. So if you have any questions or if you want if you want me to tell you more, to go uh, deeper, to look at sequential games, to look at incomplete information games and so on, well, feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to organize another Facebook Live about that. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a good day or a nice evening and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.